Okay. Um, can you hear me? Is this okay? Great. So, um, as chairman of Hyatt, let me start by welcoming all of you. That's part of my job here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, I apologize for some of the problems, so I'm a Crackberry addict, and I've had some problems getting on my Blackberry today, and as my wife will tell you, uh, that's the height of frustration for me, but we have great hopes for this property and are very excited about it. My Blackberry erased everything. <laughs> that's probably good. Um, so, <clears throat> Frank. Um, Frank would be among the top three architects in anybody's list anywhere in the world. Uh, I won't name the other two because then I'll get in trouble. Uh, but he, he uh, is also a very close friend of Margot and I. And he called me up and said, if he's going to Goa, I'm going to Goa. And that's why we ended up here. What's most unique about Frank, actually, is not just the creative part of his brain, not just the right side of his brain, but actually also the left side of his brain. He, he honestly has a very highly developed both sides and, and is very balanced in that way. So as a client, you can talk to him about costs, about budgets, about this sort of thing, just as passionately as you can about design. Uh, in terms of full disclosure, uh, as I mentioned, we're friends. When Frank got the Pritzker Prize in 89, I didn't know who the hell he was, so I went and looked in the books. And I saw this house of his in Santa Monica, and I thought, oh my god, what a disaster, it's LA. Uh, I've subsequently been in his house, and it is a phenomenal experience. But the most interesting thing was a bus ride we took together about three or four years later where he passionately described to me how an architect has to take more, uh, has to be held more accountable for what he's doing, budget, time, this sort of thing. And that from then on we became very close. We brought Burton and uh, Frank to India maybe 10 years ago uh, because we wanted him to see uh, a place that we, we love a lot. Uh, and so what I want to do, Frank, is I do want to get into your ambitions going forward. You're only 82. That means we've got another 20 or 30 years of you. Yeah, exactly. And um, we're, we're going to go into what you want to be your legacy. But what I want to do is I want to start and discuss your creative process. When I think of classical Frank Gehry, what I think of is motion, movement, fish coming out of, of Japan, and that's the image, is, is that sort of motion that you create in your buildings. Where did it come from? Well, uh, I, I grew up in architecture as a modernist, because it was right after the war, <clears throat> and the Beaux-Arts and all that stuff was no, no. So uh, then when modernism started to fail because it lost its humanity, and it, it is what built most of our cities around the world, and they're sort of lifeless and cold, and it was no, no uh, accident, I think, that architects went back to history and tried to find the roots to see where they lost the humanity. And they found it in the decor, in the pediments, and in the columns, and in the, the, the antiquities of Greece, uh, mostly. And, and they started doing that. Philip Johnson did the AT&T building with a broken pediment. Uh, Bob Venturi had done it before with his mother's house. Um, and somehow that, I couldn't get with it. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, it was not something I could get to. And I, I remember giving a talk and saying, those buildings, they come out of anthropomorphic uh, uh, DNA. And if you're going to go back, why don't you go back 300 million years to fish? You have to go back, let's go way back. 
Uh, and I started drawing that as sort of my moods against the postmodern stuff. Uh, later, I realized, the post now I realized the postmodern stuff opened the way to pluralism and, and was, uh, was very healthy in the end for, for, the, for architecture. But I couldn't do it. And I started drawing these damn fish, and I, I don't know, there's a story about fish in my grandmother's bathtub, which is true, but I don't think it has much to do with this. But, uh, and out of that, I made fish lamps, and then somebody asked me to do a sculpture. And I was looking for a, another way to find humanity, and I uh, looked at the Elgin marbles, which, in which Phidias was able to express movement with inert materials. I had a, some time, some face time with the Shiva Nataraj because Norton Simon had it on his dining room table and I was designing his house, so I spent time looking at it and realized that there was something there for, for, to be explored and then I, the fish thing started to make sense because I started looking at the uh, carp, the Japanese tanks and stuff. And I started playing with that idea. The first stuff was um, a trellis that was going to be at the beach and the wind would blow the wood up in the air and it would be frozen motion. And that never happened. And. Uh, I did make a fish sculpture that ended up in Torino, and when I stood beside it, I felt that movement, the same sense of movement uh, that I'd seen in the sculptures, and I couldn't believe it. And I cut off the tail, and I cut off the head, and I cut off the fins, and I got rid of all the kitsch parts, and it still worked. And it was out of that that this, whatever the, line, the curve language came from, something like that. And so can you <laughs> link that to Bilbao for us? Well, <clears throat> uh, well, first of all, I don't start from the outside, as many people might think, or I don't crumple paper, as I did in The Simpsons. <laughs> uh, a, re a reporter just asked me the other day, once you crumple the paper, then what do you do? <laughs> that was wonderful. You walked right into that one. Um, I think uh, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> link the, actually, I want you to link the fish to the to Bilbao, the, to Bilbao and then and then what I actually would like you to do is pick one of your buildings and take us through what is your design process? Okay. What happens? So I started Bilbao, it was a mu it, the program was a museum, a contemporary art museum, which I knew a lot about. I grew up with a lot of artists. Uh, and uh, we had a very strong director, Tom Krenz from the Guggenheim, who was kind of a genius, and he was fun to play with. And so we started from the inside and developed a relationship to the site, to the, there's a bridge, there's a 19th century city, there's a river, uh, there's issues of, of getting to the lower levels from the street, and it led to a, a sort of an amphitheater-like stairway coming from the street down into the museum. Uh, and the program was for a 400-foot gallery that Tom wanted to show Dan, a Dan Flavin piece. He actually had me design a room for this one piece. <laughs> it's now filled with Richard Serra pieces, which, uh, and the Flavin never got there. But uh, th they also wanted a signifier from the site to the city hall, a, a high reader they called it, and there was a bend in the river, so in order to see it from City Hall, it had to be high. I really thought there was a very tight budget. It was uh, 97, $100 million for 
300 and some thousand square feet. So it was, in, a, in American dollars, it was $300 a square foot, which was tight for a building like that. Um, the big gallery got fish-like. In fact, it was called the fish gallery. I called it the boat gallery, but they called it the fish gallery. They, so um, the galleries inside were, some of them had form to them, shape to them, which is usually a no-no for museum curators. But Tom asked for that. And he asked me to do classical galleries that were rectilinear for the artists who were dead who couldn't defend themselves. <laughs> and it's worked like that. The, uh, the living artists have inhabited the shape galleries. And in most cases, I've had very few complaints over the 11, 12 years from my artist friends. Museum curators hate it. <laughs> but who the hell cares about them? <laughs> Uh, no, it's just harder for them to mount shows. They have to think differently and all that stuff. Um, so that's how it got there. I picked titanium for the exterior because uh, to do those shapes, I found in earlier work, the only way I could do them economically was to use metal. And the, the technique of metal roofing goes back hundreds of years. Uh, you see copper and lead, lead copper roofs all over Italy. Uh, and they don't leak for the most part because the t technology of it, the, the, the language of roofing in metal is pretty old and pretty, pretty conservative. And so I adopted that language, and I wanted to pick a metal that would resonate with the light in Bilbao, which was where it rains probably half the year. And there are a lot of gray skies, and <clears throat> um, stainless steel or most of the metals go dead. And by accident, I found a piece of uh, titanium that I nailed to my, uh, post outside my office and it rained in LA that one day and it was a miracle. And that piece of titanium was glistening gold and so I picked that. And it was twice the cost of stainless steel, but after a lot of research I found I could make it half the thickness of stainless steel, so that brought it back to the same price. And then the Russians dumped titanium on the market. That three months period when it was being bid, and, uh, and uh, so we, we got it within budget. Uh, after the building opened, there was some residual polyurethane that spilled over from the roofing onto the front of the titanium. And an article came out in the paper in Philadelphia saying the building was a rusting hulk. And then 60 articles appeared around the world about the rusting hulk until I told one reporter, there's only one problem with saying that, is that titanium is an element and it doesn't rust. <laughs> and so they stopped. <laughs> they, there's a gotcha game going with, with people like me. Um, So that's how that got there. But one thing that's relative to the process uh, is that I was brought in those early days, in the, I guess the early 90s, to uh, using a software from the aerospace industry that's used to making airplanes and cars. It's, um, and I started using it, and it was very precise, but pretty heavy, hard to use. And when I say use, I don't even know how to turn it on, so don't, don't get excited. Um, but my office could, could do it, and uh, we did an overlay for it. But when I realized it was something important to pursue was in the bidding for Bilbao, the steel bids, six bidders 
We trained them for a week how to read the, the computer program. And six bidders came in within a 1% of each, each within 1% and 18% under budget. And that's when I said, bingo, that's a fantastic uh, tool that I can use in the future and have, and I'll talk about it. But um, the building most recently is the tower that uh, the, the uh, lady who introduced us talked about. And it started with a program for a spec uh, rental apartment building that was going to be 65 stories, 66 stories. And it was a tight budget and uh, a, de a developer who's a, a very big development company who are not known for um, overbuilding or spending more than they need to. And so it was, it was a, um, a, a, a client that, that was uh, very interested in my work, very well educated about what I did, and offered me this project, but also the tight budget. Uh, first thing I did was analyze the budget to make sure that anybody could do it for that budget, and I found that, that he was right. He was using a real budget. So that's the first thing I do for any project. Uh, and then the, the proportions of the building for the site were, were stumpy and, and not very nice at 66 stories. And I started to play with the, the height and making it 75, 76 stories gave it a slenderness ratio that worked with the uh, Woolworth building that was right next to it, which is an important New York landmark. And I wanted to respect that. I wanted to build a building that made sense in New York, that had a contextual rela relationship to what New York was. And I think that building would, wouldn't make sense anywhere else but there. I, by adding the 10 floors, we added $30 million to the budget. Uh, and I promised the owner I would get it out somehow. So we would be on, be on course. Um, the stair stepping relates to the old zoning codes in New York. It, it was just something I adopted for this building. It, it wasn't uh, required. It could have been a straight up tower. Uh, so that was a contextual nod that I made. And then I, wanted, I came up with the idea of the bay windows, which exist in New York in lower rise buildings, but don't in high rise. And so the, they don't have a picture of it. Do the bay windows allow you, when you're in the 60th floor and you walk out, you feel like you're walking out into space. So it, it became something that the rental experts uh, said was a real asset that would uh, help them with the rentability. If you put them all in the same place in the, on each floor, you would have a straight line, and I didn't like the, the rigidity of that. So I wanted to move it around so I had a more free-flowing, um, relaxed kind of imagery. Uh, the building sometimes looks like it's raining. It's got sort of drop. In order to do that, we brought this fancy computer stuff in and worked with the subcontractor and developed a language um, to build the, the, these things within the budget, within the budget of a normal uh, tower in New York. So we had to be on that if, we were, if it was going to happen. And we spent a lot of time with, with the subcontractor. Uh, there were people I'd worked with before. They actually did the Bilbao uh, metal skin, and they did the Disney Hall skin. So, 
Uh, but there was no free lunch. We had to get it done. And it took quite a long time, going floor by floor, developing each piece so they could be prefabricated and brought to the site. Um, the frame was going to be concrete. Everything was pretty normal about it, except for the, the bay windows and the stair step and the 10 extra floors. So once we got the, the curtain wall in budget, uh, the frame concrete was normal, so we, uh, and we used a low carbon, a low carbon footprint uh, uh, concrete that's 50% less than normal concrete. It's, a, it's the same concrete that's built the Freedom Tower, which is a couple of blocks away from this one. Uh, the bonus we got from that is that it set up faster, so we picked up time and construction, which is money. Uh, it was cleaner on the site, cleaner to build, not as messy as normal concrete. It set up stronger, so we could have picked up an inch per floor, so we could have had another 76 inches. We didn't know in advance that that was going to happen. Uh, and none of the materials driven to the site, the batch, the rolling things that bring the concrete to the site, and then the, the, the um, inspector has a slump test. He puts a cone in it, lays it on the, on the floor, and measures how much it drops. And w usually there's a 20% waste, waste in that. And we, had, we, registered, we did the whole thing with no waste. None of the batches were sent back. So that, along with the setting up quicker, the clean, uh, and then the magical computer program, which is so accurate to seven decimal points that there were very few change orders. There were zero change orders on the, on the exterior skin and eight change orders on the concrete. If you add all that up, that paid for the extra 10 floors. So, um, and so I've become really passionate about that. So <laughs> when Frank and I talk, if, what's interesting is, <laughs> he's as passionate about the issues of cost and waste and, and efficiency as he is about design and art and that sort of thing. So you've had a material effect on our built environment. We all are the beneficiaries of what you've, what you've been able to do. I want to do more. I know. <laughs> uh, So my question is, what do you want your legacy to be? Is it, is it, is it Bilbao and Disney? Uh, you have been, so I need to take an aside. Frank's a troublemaker. I'm a troublemaker. So my problem is when we start doing this on stage, we, we intentionally egg each other on. And he got in a lot of trouble for being critical of the way people are thinking about green buildings. And there is a very solid logic behind. They even mentioned it in this book. Yes, I know that in, his, in the bio, if you look at the last couple of lines, that came out of. Um, I misspoke, as Herman Cain said. Yeah, it came out of an interview that we did. So talk about green, talk about what do you want your legacy to be, and what do you think is the right way to think about green, and most importantly, so what are you doing about it? Well, two basic things. One is that as I grew up in architecture from the very beginning, from the 60s, all my architect friends, everybody was already talking about energy savings as part of our building, part of our mandate. Uh, and the, the things we tried to do were more primitive, like my house has a skylight at the top 
And in California, you, may, you have maybe two or three weeks where you need air conditioning. Instead, I push a button on the hot days, open the thing, and the heat goes out. Well, that's what the teepees were doing. So, uh, and the orientation of buildings, the, where you put windows and all of those things, were all considered important and discussed way back then and for years. In fact, uh, in the 80s, I did a building for an energy company in Germany, and we did every energy idea that you could come, trom walls and wind things, and, and I even wanted them to install a gym for their workers and then put bicycles out on the street in front. I said, if you're an energy company, why don't you let the people of this town come and, and uh, do their cardio on these bikes and attach it, hook it to the grid, and then you build up the, you know. And I still think that's a great idea. <laughs> and I think you should put one in every hotel. <laughs> I knew I'd get in trouble. <laughs> Talk about GTX and what it does for waste okay, and, so, and efficiency. So what I, well, the other thing I was going to say before that is that I teach at Yale and I see these students coming out into a profession that's been kneecapped over the years by overprotection and by un, uh, a policy of not taking responsibility like the master builder model that I am, like to emulate or think about. And so the, the profession has been infantilized, and contractors are taking more responsibility, and project managers are coming in. And, and so there's layers of, of additional people protecting the client from the architect, which makes no sense. Uh, and I hate to see these kids coming out into that. So, this computer stuff uh, enables you to get back in the game and take more responsibility. I've talked to the lawyers, uh, and I've talked to insurance companies, and, and I think it'll make a difference. I think we can do it, and I have been doing it. So I, I take, I'm active all the way to the end till the building's finished and stay in the game as a responsible member of, of the team. We've been able to do that and eliminate a lot of extra supervision by project managers that don't take responsibility. They're just sort of reinterpreting what I do and costing money. In the, the construction industry, thinks of itself now as a, that 30% of, of the budget of a building is waste. And the AIA just came out and said it was more like 50%, which is astounding. So what is it, a $3 trillion business? One trillion at least is waste. That's sustainability issue, as far as I'm concerned. And we were able, by, eliminating change orders, you eliminate 10 to 12 percent of that. By eliminating the extra, cons the managers, you, you eliminate another 3 percent. And by working with the, the subs as a, as a leader in it, because they don't know what you, why you did the curves or anything, and if it, there's any trouble, they'll just straighten it out. Say, just straighten out, everything will be okay. <laughs> So you lose, your, you lose your design, you lose your building, blah, blah, blah. So uh, we've developed, I have a separate company. We got the bell? We got the bell. I, we have a separate company that, called Gary Technologies, and we're, we developed an a overlay, a GTX, we call it right now, that translates all the all the software that's being used by the construction industry. So you get, uh, you can include Revit or Bentley or Rhino or whatever else. Elephant, they don't have Elephant yet, but they could. <laughs> and uh, we've spread the joy to a lot of architects like Zaha 
and John Nivelle and uh, many of the architects you know about. And we've included a, uh, a sustainability company as part of the team that measures, that allows us to measure carbon footprint as we design. And so it's very uh, thorough and complete. And the aim is to eliminate at least half of that waste and more if we can. So that's, that's what we're doing. Do I have time for one more? Or we? Yes. Yeah. So one more quick topic, and that is India. Uh, India has a long history of really remarkable architecture. You and I and Margo and Berta went to Sanchi. We went to El Ora. You know the Taj Mahal, uh, Le Corbusier, and Chandigarh. But it seems that in the world of architecture, they've lost their voice over the last 50 years, or maybe even 100 years. What, what would you do if, to try and stimulate great architecture in India and a development of that voice, a regaining of their, their own uh, architectural voice? The issue, I find this in, with students. When I start with the students, I have them write their signature. And then they put them on the table, and each one looks. I say, look how different they are. You, you'd recognize yours, you'd recognize. And that's you. So do that with your architecture. Do that with your, with your design. Don't think of who else. Don't worry about what this guy's doing. Don't worry about what Frank Gehry did. Don't worry about anything except to put yourself out there on the line. And do it. trust your intuition and work with it. I think that works. If people, I mean, you've got all the history, you've got all the beautiful background, you've got the, that in your DNA. You don't have to think about it. You think about the times we're in, the issues you're, you're dealing with, and especially now, the issues are very acute in a downtime, but uh, especially in the, in the US, it's horrible right now. But, even with that, you can find ways. I, I've always said, if somebody else can make a building for that budget, I can, and you can. And you can add the, you can add the luster of something called architecture to it within those budgets. And I think uh, to trust your intuition, trust your heritage, that you've got it already, you, you, it's in your bones, you know it, and play with it and come out of it. And, and uh, something will come out that's very appropriate for, for the time and place. I'm sure of that. And don't get self-conscious about it. And don't worry about what anybody else did. Great. That's it. Thank you very much.